Imagine living in a world where beauty is as diverse as we are. Imagine living in a world where you're not judged by the color of your skin or the hair that you choose to keep. Imagine your children having the choice to make decisions on how to express themselves. I thought I lived in that world. In fact, I was pretty sure I lived in that world. Because for the longest time, I expressed myself as I pleased. I made choices. I wasn't the girl who conformed. I knew this until I recently decided to cut my hair. I decided to make my hair go natural. Go back to my roots, literally. And then I realized I actually had been living in a world where there were standards, where my choice maybe wasn't so much my choice. And thinking about it, why is this even a conversation? Why is this sort of hair still being discussed in 2016? Why is it a polarizing subject? Very recently in South Africa, a young girl, Zuleika Patel, a beautiful, charming, feisty girl, made headline news. She was protesting to wear the hair that grew out of her scalp. <laughs> Which we can laugh at, and looking at the pictures, it actually looked like something out of the black civil rights movements in the 60s. And yet, we're in 2016. Does this mean hair actually signifies something? And more importantly, if a black person chooses to wear their hair naturally as it grows out of their scalp, are you making a statement? Are you being a rebel? Are you returning to your roots? Is it saying something? I grew up in the 70s. And even then, as a young girl, I knew hair meant something. I knew it was going to define how people treated me. I knew it was going to define how people viewed me. It said something even before I opened my mouth. And I knew this absolutely, because even in my own house, there was two conflicting and two very different views on hair. My mother, in the 70s, was a stunning woman and she wore her hair in an afro. She was at the peak of her sexuality, and it's almost like she fronted it with her hair. On the other hand, my grandmother, who also had a beautiful afro, except I didn't know it till I was about eight years old, because she hid it. It was always under her head stuff. So I knew hair had currency, except I didn't. I thought I was making choices. Now, looking back in the 70s and thinking about the beautiful styles that we all used to don, for those of us in the audience who might have been there in the 70s, if you had been in New York or Nairobi, you'd be mistaken for thinking you're in the same exact sport. Why? Because we all wore our hairs in wonderful fools. And yet, our story across the pond is so different. In the US, it symbolized empowerment. It symbolized rebellion. It symbolized fighting for the civil rights. In Africa, though, it was something slightly different, but yet we wore it proudly. It probably came to us by way of the airlift that happened in the 60s, with a lot of people going off to the US, to the UK, the Soviet Union. When they came back, they have these beautiful hairs and these stories of civil rights movements. We chose to wear the styles, even though the story didn't quite relate to us. But of course it made sense because we were also fighting the colonialists. But to be frank, the styles were groovy and quite iconic. As I grew up, and it turned into the 80s, and suddenly, the Afro disappeared, almost like the Loch Ness Monster. We knew of it, 
We knew it existed, but we rarely sighted it. Now the hairs had changed. I was young then, but I knew there was something different. The curls were looser. And perhaps with the, on, with the new televisions, which were colored, I might add, and TV shows such as Top of the Pops, we started to see new styles coming through. The Jerry Cow was very popular in the US, and we started to see it coming across as the color kit on this side. Many of us couldn't quite figure out how to do that, but of course, we religiously followed the pop stars. And I think most iconic for me was Salt and Pepper. They wore their hair differently. It was rebellious. It symbolized the 80s, the rap stars. But of course, the hair had changed now. It was no longer Afro. We were using hot combs. I remember going to a chain's salon, and she would use this hot comb to straighten my hair so that I could fit in and go to school. The same thing was probably happening across the pond, because as we know it, if people didn't conform, they didn't get the jobs they wanted. They needed to be standardized. The pop stars, however, were reveling. But as you can see, Although their hairs were different, colored, cut differently, it was still straight. I grew up into the 90s, and the hair was getting bigger, fuller, wavier. Now I could actually afford to have some hairstyles. And as soon as I could, as soon as I finished high school, almost like a passage of right, I went and had my hair relaxed. It was a thing to do. Of course, I thought I was making a choice. But looking back, there were many of us. The influence then was probably things like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, for those who remember. The family, Vivian, Ashley, Hilary, long wavy hair. They could stand in the wind and the hair would be flowing except they were black like me. And it was then the advent of the weave culture started. Now there was a secret weapon. We had chemicals and we had extensions. I spoke a lot with my girlfriends how I could achieve this look. And of course, we didn't have the money or the know-how. So instead, we went to the Tony Braxton route and cut our straight hair the hair with the chemicals. But as soon as I got my first job in 1999, I immediately started saving religiously to achieve this look. And looking back, if I had saved that feverishly for a house, <laughs> I would probably own two. The cost of this hair is enough to pay for two mortgages over the two decades that I spent finding the perfect Brazilian, Malaysian, and Indian hair. It was an obsession. And even more obsessive was the perfect blend. You were not allowed to tell I was wearing fake hair, even though I was wearing fake hair. The ultimate goal was that it blended seamlessly. And so it went on and on. And even more alarming was the realization that now I was using it to create an image. I was using it to become a person. This hair was my calling card. Before you said hello to me, you knew that I was a corporate woman, that I had a serious job, not just like any other person. I was a banker. My hair was cut so. It sat only on my left shoulder, and it was always perfect, an armor. I even used it to hide my physical flaws. My right eye is blind, and this hair was perfect to cover this floor. It was an armor, and I wore it religiously, year in, year out. And then, of course, something happened, and this changed. Two years 
ago, I was joined by two little girls, my daughters. And now I had to make a decision. It didn't seem like a difficult decision because of course the love of my life were in my life. But something troubling happened. As soon as these girls were born, I realized the hair is gas natural. <laughs> And I had to actually wash it and maybe even condition it. I didn't know what I was going to use, which was ironic. Given at this point, I was actually running hair salons. <laughs> so you would think I'm the expert. I should know what to do. But oddly, I hadn't actually seen my hair in its natural state for two decades. What was I going to do? So now I have to ask some comfortable questions like, what do you do to wash your hair? Is it panga soap? <laughs> no idea. So I made the decision to actually start looking at keeping my hair as it grows and go natural. For the sake of my girls' health and maintenance, I did want them to have friends. So I did. And of course, I stumbled upon this new world. The world that was actually different, yet the same. This world was now connected by technology. A movement had begun. People were actually going natural. Except unlike the 60s and the 70s, there was no rallying call. There was nobody who was iconic and saying, I am the natural leader. Let's all become naturalists. But yet, we were connected by technology. So a whole bunch of people, men and women, were beginning to embrace their roots. And I stumbled on this world. But now I started to ask myself the question, why was it that when I chose to go natural, there was a new type of judgment? And what was this hair actually symbolizing? It's 2016, and we're still spending a ridiculous amount of time talking about hair black hair. And I decided that there was actually a lesson that I was going to learn from this change. And this lesson was going to be presented to me by way of my hair. This lesson was about acceptance. I finally confronted who I was as God intended. And I was going to be okay with that. And especially so because one of my favorite books by a lady called Cherry Scott Cutter starts by saying, rule number one, as a lesson in life, you will be given one body. Whether you love it or you hate it, it will be yours for the duration of your life. So the quicker you get comfortable with it, the easier things flow in your life. <laughs> so I took a chance. And now I walk around with my hair naturally. Of course, today is a special occasion. <laughs> but this is still a natural style. This is how I wore my hair for almost two decades. As you can see, it was perfect. Or so I thought. It was a representation of the person I wanted to be. It was a representation to the world. And now I had to face and accept who I was. No additions. Wow. Wow. This is how I am. And so I want to leave you with a lesson that I have taken away from all this experience. And this lesson is, I am not my hair, because now I know my hair is actually me. <laughs>